Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. This coming weekend, I'm speaking at the We Can Reason Conference in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Looking ahead, it's Denver, my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'll be in Rochester and then Sarnia, Ontario, Canada. All the details, times, dates, places, tickets, etc., at sethandrews.com slash events. We're continuing a conversation that actually started last week, talking about intelligent or not so intelligent design. It made so much sense to talk to an evolutionary biologist. She is author of the book, The Not So Intelligent Designer, and I'm glad to call her friend, Dr. Abby Hafer. So good to have you. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me on. You have made, I don't know, at least part of your career debunking the idea that we live in a fine-tuned universe, right? I mean, just give me a few of the things that rub you wrong about the way things are quote-unquote designed. Well, my specialty really is looking at bad design, particularly of the human body, but I can also relate it to other animals. I should explain, I have a doctorate in zoology. But I've spent the last 20 plus years of my life teaching human anatomy and physiology. So as I teach human anatomy and physiology, I cannot help but notice a lot of things that really could have been done better. And because I also have training in zoology, I often notice other animals that got better deals, which means that if we are considered, you know, the pinnacle of creation, well, I have some words that I'd like to share with our creator. Like I think um, I'm, I mentioned earlier that I wish I had the eye of an eagle or a hawk. I mean, would you take the eagle eye over what we have, you and I? They've definitely got the better eyes in terms of accuracy. So, yeah, I mean, there are lots of things that we could have that would be nicer. But the things that I really, really love are the things where we got a version that it's just plain wrong and there are other animals that got better versions of the same thing for instance in our eyes our eyes are built a lot the same way that eagle eyes are but have you heard about how our retinas are backwards uh, something about the image being inverted well there's images that are inverted that's that just has to do with pinhole cameras and physics and such okay. but the thing is the actual biology of our eye, the part of our eye that actually takes on the image is called the retina. And our retina actually has the photoreceptor cells, the cells that are sensitive to light at the very, very back of the retina. And then it has blood vessels lying on top of that, and it has nerve fibers lying on top of that, so that the light that enters your eye actually has to fight its way past all of these nerve fibers and past all of these blood vessels before it gets to the photosensitive cells underneath all that rubbish. And so basically, we do not get accurate high information images to our retinas and a lot of image processing has to be done before we can even start the process of seeing and making sense of it. When I see Ken Ham at the Creation Museum talking about how amazing the eye is and then I see him wearing prescription lenses for vision correction, hashtag irony. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, I just no, absolutely. Hashtag irony. 
And there are lots of things like that that go on that people don't even think about. But the point is, we've got these retinas, even if your eyes or my eyes work perfectly as well as they possibly can. So I'm not even talking about those of us who need glasses or anything like that. But even if our eyes are working as well as they possibly could, they still have this fundamental design flaw, which is no matter how good they are, you still have the light fighting its way past this other stuff. Whereas invertebrates like squid and octopuses actually have retinas where the photosensitive part is actually facing the light, which makes sense when you think about it. The best analogy I can use is if you were to take your camera and put some cotton or various other things in front of the lens so that there are fibers and such between the lens and the outside world, that's basically the way our eyes are built. Whereas that's not the way that squid eyes are built. So the point is, we just got a design that even when it's working as well as it possibly can, it's just bad compared to squid and octopuses. So you really have to ask who God likes better. Well, thinking about design, quote unquote design, for good and for ill in the animal kingdom, I know you spoke about the giraffe and the laryngeal nerve. I think it was it supposed to go 14 inches, but instead it goes like 14 feet. Yes, that is correct. That is one portion of one nerve where we have this odd thing, which happens in all of us, which is that this nerve actually goes and wraps around one of the blood vessels coming out of the heart which in us is kind of a moderate, unnecessary trip for this fiber. But then, of course, giraffes have very, very long necks, but they have your same basic vertebrate body plan. And so, yes, that extra length of nerve just has to become very, very, very long in giraffes. But I'd like to talk about some other things where, I mean, the problem with the laryngeal nerve example, I think, is that although it's definitely delightfully weird, it does not do us actual harm, where there are plenty of other things that do us actual harm. For instance, testicles. Um, <laughs> me- yes, I, I can hear you crossing your legs. Um, the point is that men are all familiar with with the fact that the testicles are vulnerable. So this is really not a good thing if it could be avoided. And as you probably know, our cold-blooded relatives don't have this problem and their sperm-making equipment is safe inside them. But if you have taken anatomy and physiology or anything resembling it, you probably know that for humans, the testes hang outside the body because they have to stay slightly cooler than normal body temperature if they're going to create sperm. And so we are stuck with this kind of you know weird setup where the testicles have to hang outside the body even while all our other soft organs like our brain and our stomach and our livers and all this kind of thing are all safely protected inside our bodies. But, you know, people will say, oh, but look what God did. God put the testes on the outside of the body so that you have testes at slightly cooler temperature. And isn't that wonderful? What great planning. The problem there is, I mean, let's start with the basics. It's like, who thought of the idea that normal body temperature should be too hot for sperm production? I mean, this does not sound like good planning to me. But... What becomes ever more ironic is that there are plenty of warm-blooded animals that have internal testicles, and it includes all birds. Did you hear me? All birds, plus fellow mammals like whales and dolphins, and also elephants and rhinoceroses and things like this. They all have internal testicles. So you have to ask yourself who God likes better. (laughs) <laughs> Is it rhinoceroses or men? I have rhinoceros envy, uh, as well as squid envy. We're going to do as well eyes as, well as well. We should, yes, yeah, yeah. But you're about to become more envious. This is something I just love, and this deserves a bit more writing about. But I have covered this in the not so intelligent designer, which is my book. 
You've heard of convertibles, right? Those nice, fun, ragtop cars that you can drive around in in nice weather. Convertibles are not just for cars. There are some animals, some mammals, like rats and mice, that have convertible testicles, basically, where they can tuck them inside to keep them out of harm's way. But if they want to reproduce, then they can take them out, let them cool off and make some new sperm, and away they go, and then they can reproduce. Now, think of this from the human standpoint. From the human standpoint, this would mean that you could have both protection and you could control your fertility. Human men would kill for that kind of thing. The idea that you could just basically turn off your fertility and turn on your fertility depending upon when you want to use it. Wouldn't that be a great system? Yeah, I'm but sure we- there were women worldwide who would be hugely <laughs> grateful for us to sort of take on that mantle much more, right? Reproductive right, and, responsibility. Right. And and men as well, I'm sure, would love to have something that simple that they could do. So as I said, this is something that rats and mice got. So you have to ask yourself why the rats and mice got a better deal than human men did. To make things more interesting, in the rodent world, there's also a phenomenon called the Bruce effect named for its discoverer, Hilda Bruce. And what she discovered is that female rats and mice can actually reabsorb their litters if they are pregnant, if they come into contact with the smell of a new male. So this is, you know, another form of birth control where if you could just smell something Women could control their fertility that way if they got the equipment that rats and mice got. If I may ask a question, though, what's the utility of that? It senses via the olfactory organ a new male. What's the end zone for absorbing the potential offspring? Well, we will start with the fact that think of the advantage of just being able to absorb unwanted pregnancies, particularly given our politics right now. Wouldn't that be nice? But the evolutionary end zone in this is mice and rats or mice live in colonies. And very often there will be one reproductive male. So if a new male comes along and kicks out the old male, Basically, he's going to commit infanticide on anything that is produced from the old male's genetic stock. They have great smellers, so they can tell the difference. So therefore, it's worth the female's while to just reabsorb that litter in order to start reproducing with the new male. Well, if you and I are speaking from a position of, I mean, I guess you don't have to be omnipotent to be a better designer, but any other examples? come to your mind? How would you better design everybody and everything? Well, okay. Since we're having so much fun talking about reproduction, other animals, including other vertebrates, are able to reproduce without males. And you can see how there are some women who might think that this would be a great advantage to have. Help me um, out. I, I missed the word. Reproduce without what? Males. Without males. They do not need male input. Okay. They can just basically make copies of themselves. They can clone themselves is what it comes down to. And this includes snakes and sharks and all kinds of interesting creatures. And right now, walking around in the world, there's also a brand new all-female species of crayfish, which has evolved within the last, say, 10 to 20 years. So the next time that some creationist tells you, well, but you never see evolution happening, or you only see it in bacteria, or this kind of thing, and somehow they think bacteria evolving doesn't count. This is a new species, a multicellular species that has evolved in the last 10 to 20 years, and we have documented it's happening. Like a crawfish Um, uh, Cambrian explosion, if you will. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to participate, Dr. Haver. I just want to play along, right? (laughs) Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as I said, there's the whole business of being able to reproduce without males, which I'm sure some human females would like to be able to do. 
Then there's the whole problem with the human female reproductive system, where the basic problem is that, well, childbirth is very hard because we have large heads because we're, as we say, where I come from, because we are wicked smart. Mm. Um, We have large heads, we have large brains, so we have large heads, but at the same time, we walk upright. So we walk on two legs, which means that you really need narrower hips because walking with very, very wide hips is very inefficient and difficult. So women's hips have to be narrow enough on the one hand that we can walk because otherwise we would die in the natural environment. But on the other hand, the hips have to be wide enough that human babies with their big heads can still be born. And the upshot is an uneasy compromise that does not work very well, and it's very harmful to some individuals. It kills a lot of women, even in our modern era, and certainly in older times, it was not unusual for women to die in childbirth, and it was not unusual for infants to die of the process of being born. So it's really not a great system, and you would have thought that the creator of the universe could have done a better job, and a better job is possible because, for instance, kangaroos are also bipeds, but what they do is that they give birth to very small embryo-like young, which then finish their development on the outside of the body in the mother's pouch. And the mother's pouch comes complete with a nipple for nursing. So the babies develop on the outside of the body of their bipedal mother, which is a much better way to do it if you are going to be a biped, and particularly if you are going to be a biped with large heads, which is what we are. Um, So we could have gotten this easy, simple solution, but we didn't. If I was the designer, I'd be tempted to set up a model where I just, you know, one click on Amazon, like I would like a child. And then I I mean, and, that's, and, and, and they would just saying. deliver or, or <laughs> it's like if you could set up an aquarium in your living room and get it to develop there. I mean, there are possibilities. Exactly. Back to uh, the, the bone structure of the primates. And I'd mentioned this earlier as if I know what I'm talking about. I am leaning on the shoulders of primatologists. Is it true That the reason that our knees become arthritic and wear out is because we were not originally bipeds? That is accurate. Yes, we have a whole bunch of problems that come about because we walk upright when our ancestors walked on all fours. This is why we have a bunch of different back problems, because likewise, our lower backs in particular need to be able to hold up a whole lot of weight. And it's the difference between going from a suspension bridge to a pillar. And, you know, the life of a pillar is one that has to be able to hold up a whole lot more weight. It needs a whole lot more compression strength, basically. Same thing with our knees. Our knees have to hold up a lot more weight than they would if we were walking on all fours. Coming up next, we're going to get into the whole reproduction thing. What was this quote-unquote intelligent designer thinking? More with Dr. Abby Hafer next. Talking here with Dr. Abby Hafer. She is an evolutionary biologist. She is author of the book, The Not-So-Intelligent Designer, which, of course, I will link in the description box and tell everybody to buy the book because it is amazing. Okay, Dr. Hafer, the designer, any other ideas for decreasing bad design or creating a better design? Well, I mean, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the bad design of human reproduction because there's also the whole business of the lack of implantation. When an egg gets fertilized, it is only a few days old when it must implant on the lining of the uterus if it is going to continue to develop. And this is before a person necessarily even knows that they are pregnant, so there are some changes that have already taken place. 
But here's what I'm getting at. Some fairly chunky number of pregnancies fail to implant. And then the fertilized egg just washes out with menstrual flow. So think about this. Again, you're thinking about all the anti-abortion advocates out there saying, oh, God creates a soul at the moment of conception and this kind of thing. Well, why does God create a soul at the moment of conception only to have 25% of those souls last a few days and then fail to implant on the uterine lining? Could it be argued then that that God is the world's most prolific abortion doctor? Oh, God is the world's busiest abortionist by far, Hmm. by far. And then there are also sort of post-implantation miscarriages to the point where a fairly large percentage of fertilized eggs never make it through the gestational process. So they die before they ever can really experience much of anything. And you just got to wonder, you know, who thought of that? And for that matter, who thought of obstetric fistula, which is basically where after, during a particularly difficult labor in women, There is so much pressing of the baby's body and that hard head that I was talking about earlier. And even though infant heads are softer than grown-up heads, they're still hard enough that in a prolonged labor, you can have the baby's body pressing against the woman's softer tissues and against the bone in her birth canal for long enough that some of that tissue is deprived of blood and oxygen and therefore dies. And this is really disgusting, but this is God's fault. So I'm going to stick it to the creator, whoever (laughs) it is. Um, That the point is that you can wind up having what is called obstetric fistula, which is where the birth canal, the vagina, winds up having the tissue between that passage and either the urinary passage or the rectum, you can wind up having the tissue dissolving between those different tubes so that women actually cannot control their flow of urine or their flow of feces, all because they gave birth. And does this sound like a good design to you? It does you know, not. No, it, it does. Yeah. It does not. And again, if we had been designed like kangaroos, where you could just take the baby out of the uterus at a very, very, very young age, when it is still just basically an embryo, just take that embryo out of the uterus, stick it into a pouch on the outside, and away you go. And if you're going to give birth, seriously, it's a much better way of doing it. You do not, therefore, risk obstetric fistula, which is debilitating. You do not risk dying in childbirth. There are all kinds of advantages to this system, which we did not get. So when you hear people talk about fine-tuning, A lot of this, I think, becomes so simple as to become a punchline. It's look at the trees. I hear a lot of those types of things. You know, look at the beauty, look at complexity, et cetera. As someone who has uh, done so much homework, has had so much education into how things operate, complexity does not mean great design, right? Wouldn't an engineer want the simplest version of a mechanism? You've actually hit on a very, very good thing. Yes, evolution creates very complex systems, Um, sometimes, in fact, needlessly complex systems, because as you said, a designer would actually go for the simplest process that works. What we cannot do as evolved creatures is kind of go back and do a reboot. So whereas in something that is designed, like a sound system, We went from wax cylinders, for example, in recorded music, to vinyl discs, to CDs, to completely digital online music formats. And each time we, oh, and I forgot cassette tapes in there as well. (laughs) Each time we went back and we redesigned the whole thing from start to finish to be able to provide music in a new way. We didn't get that with, say, the way we give birth. 
or the way we see or the way we digest our food. We didn't get any of that because we are not designed, because we start with what we've got, and then there are random mutations that take place, and maybe some of those mutations work and some of those mutations don't. The people with the deleterious mutations have a lot of problems and can die, and or I should say not just people, but the organisms with the deleterious mutations die. Nature doesn't care. And if there's a slightly better mutation that comes along, then that gives a selective advantage, then that advantage may be carried forward. But it's all just basically about dying and breeding and dying and breeding. But what this means is that you can get lots and lots and lots of complexity through this. But what you don't see is design. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I'm carrying along a lot of evolutionary baggage. And sometimes that baggage is, what, it doesn't mean anything, it's just there, and sometimes it can be detrimental. Would that be an accurate way to say it? I mean, it's baggage no matter how you slice it. Yeah, actually, and I will give two examples of baggage then. Sorry about that metaphor. Baggage, no matter how you slice it, is a mixed metaphor. I'm sorry. It's a mixed metaphor. That's true. But I'm going to give you, let's call them evolutionary leftovers also known in the profession as vestigial organs or vestigial reactions. So I'm going to give you an example of a bit of evolutionary leftovers that does us no harm, and then I'll talk about one that does do us harm. So let's start with a really fun one, the erector pili muscle. You have hair all over your body. You're probably aware of this. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you get goosebumps, right? When your little hairs literally stand up straight. You get goosebumps when you're cold and when you're tired. Did you ever think about that? I mean, we have it happen all the time to the point where we don't even scratch our heads and think, why did it do that anyway? Does it accomplish anything as, I mean, in my current evolved higher primate state? It accomplished something back when we were furry. This is a reminder that we are evolved from furry animals. We have these tiny little muscles attached to every hair called an erector pili muscle. And they literally will pull your hair up so that it's taller. And it happens when you are cold because if you are a furry animal and your fur suddenly becomes thicker, that's like putting on a warmer coat. For instance, if you've ever seen birds, which I know are not mammals, but the same process of um, trying to provide insulation applies. If you've ever seen birds in a tree on a really, really cold day, have you noticed that they fluff their feathers up? What they're doing there is that they're providing a thicker layer of insulation between their warm bodies and the cold air. And that's what happens to us when we get goosebumps. Our little hairs are being pulled upright so that we literally have a thicker coating of insulation to try and retain our body warmth. This works if you have fur. It doesn't help us because our fur at this point is minuscule and doesn't help us stay warm. But it's an evolutionary leftover. It shows that we used to be furry animals because we get goosebumps when we're cold. And the other time we get goosebumps is when we're frightened. And the reason for that is because animals in nature try to look bigger when they are frightened. It's a way of trying to stare down an enemy, whether it's a predator or whether it is somebody you may fight with. If you can make yourself look bigger, the opposition may decide to just go the other way and not have a fight with you after all. And of course, thicker fur is also going to mean that it's going to be harder to find the skin, harder to find the throat, and so on. So animals in nature actually spend a great deal of time trying to avoid fights. That may not be what you think, you know, when you watch nature videos and this kind of thing, but fights can be fatal in the natural world because they can get infected and wounds can be very dangerous. So animals are all better off if they can avoid fights. 
if various animals can just puff themselves up and make themselves look bigger and can therefore walk away from a fight instead of engaging, they're better off. That's what our erector pili muscles do. They pull our hair up when we are cold and when we are frightened because we used to have fur and now we don't. So it's an evolutionary leftover. It doesn't do us any good now, but it doesn't do us any harm. So it kind of sticks around and well, there it is. If you were the designer, would you uh, make us furry creatures these days? Or would you think you'd just go like, would you, you know, a waxing, like a divine waxing so we had nothing, <laughs> or a lasering? Which would you prefer? I don't know. I mean, the fur on my body doesn't really do me any harm, so I'm not concerned about it one way or another. You know, oh. either way is fine with me, really. The other thing we should do, since we're talking about evolutionary leftovers, otherwise known as vestigial organs, let's talk about the one that kills us sometimes called the appendix. The appendix is a little teeny sort of worm-like hollow dead-end tube that hangs off of our large intestine. And a dead-end tube is the perfect place for a bacterial colony. And in animals that digest woody plants, like rabbits and koala bears and all of this kind of thing, they actually have these huge dead-end areas to their large intestine the areas that are now our cecum and our appendix, they have these huge, long, fancy versions of these things. And the bacteria there are capable of digesting wood. And so what happens is that the bacteria digest the plant material and then essentially the vertebrate, you know, the koala bear or whomever, they then essentially eat the bacteria. So it's a very beneficial system for those animals that digest cellulose. We don't digest cellulose. We can't digest wood. So we have these little leftover organs that used to do us some favors, but don't anymore. But the problem is that these dead ends are still the perfect place for a bacterial colony, they have attenuated and attenuated as the millennia have gone by, but they have not gone away, which is why you occasionally get a really nasty colony of bacteria started in the appendix and it winds up becoming infected. And if it bursts, you're dead. This is the lethal infection known as appendicitis. It used to routinely kill people in the days before decent surgical techniques. Since we've developed decent, clean surgical techniques, if somebody has appendicitis, they're rushed to the hospital, the appendix is snipped out, they are sewn up, all is well and good, and they go about their lives for the rest of their lives, and they are fine. Now, I should explain that there is a small amount of immune tissue in the appendix, but there are immune tissues throughout the rest of the digestive system. So we don't actually need the appendix in any way at all. And we'd really be better off without it because as it is, we are carrying around this ticking time bomb in our abdomens that can blow up and kill us at any time with no warning and no particular reason for it. So, I mean, if you were a designer, you would not give a human an appendix. You just wouldn't. Uh, Dr. Hafer, I actually had to go look up cecum uh, because I'm, I have no idea what that. Oh, okay. Cecum, a pouch or large tube-like structure in the lower abdominal cavity that receives undigested food material from the small intestine. Am I learning? Is that correct? You are learning. That is correct. The okay. cecum is the first portion of your large intestine, which okay. is the bit of your digestive system after the small intestine. But the thing is that hanging off the bottom of the cecum is the appendix, this blind tube, you know, this this tube with only one opening. See, and this is why humans are born with big brains, because we, we need room to learn about the cecum. And that's uh, I, correct. I OK, I'm just glad to know that. My conversation with Dr. Abby Hafer will continue in just a second. Hang on. Thank you. 
Continuing my conversation with evolutionary biologist Dr. Abby Hafer. She is author of the book, The Not So Intelligent Designer. We've been talking vestigial organs. Anything else? Well, as I said, I would definitely eliminate the appendix. Just get rid of it. It does us no good whatsoever. Get rid of wisdom teeth while we're at it. For that matter, our teeth in general, you want to talk about not getting something fair. We get two sets of teeth for our entire lives. We are long-lived creatures. We get baby teeth. Then they get replaced with our adult teeth. And the adult teeth are expected to last us for the rest of our lives. And they generally don't. It's why we had to use our large brains to invent dentists. Meanwhile, sharks shed their teeth and grow new teeth on a routine basis all the time. It's why you find fossil sharks' teeth on beaches in a lot of places. Does God like sharks better than humans? Because sharks can just keep making new teeth as they need them and shedding the old ones before they have the chance to get cavities and infections and before sharks need root canals and things like that. All of which is probably good for us because I can't imagine anything more dangerous than a shark with a toothache. (laughs) But on the other hand, as I said, those sharks got the good stuff when it came to teeth and we didn't. And I would like to call the manager about that one. I don't blame you. Final thoughts? Anything else you want to throw out before we call it? There's the ability to produce vitamin C, which we lack, but other animals have which means we can get scurvy, but other animals don't. There are some animals that in principle could get scurvy, but we can get scurvy because we cannot produce vitamin C, but other animals can. And if you really want to know something that will make you furious, it is that we possess the biochemical pathway to make vitamin C, but it's broken. So Like we what, possess- that gene just switched off? Yeah, basically the last step in the process got switched off. And the basic evolutionary reason behind this is that since our primate ancestors ate fresh fruits and vegetables anyway, because they were swinging around in trees, when that gene had a mutation and that last step in the process of making vitamin C got turned off, it didn't do us any harm because we were eating fruits and vegetables anyway. But then, as I said, when we thought we would get smart and live in climates where there were not necessarily easy accesses to fruits and vegetables or when we went on long sea voyages, then people started getting scurvy and they didn't really know what caused it. But this is something that, for instance, colonists in New England got during the winter time. It's what people got on long sea voyages. This is why British people became known as limeys because they launched these seagoing expeditions all over the world. And then the sailors got scurvy, but it was discovered that citrus juices had a lot of what was needed. They didn't quite call it vitamin C at the time. But so as a result, British sailors were given a small dose of lime juice every day to prevent vitamin C, which is why Brits became known as limeys. Native Americans discovered that there was basically an evergreen tree called the aneta, that if they boiled that, if they made tea out of that, that also had vitamin C in the tea. And that was how they, for instance, survived long northerly winters when you wouldn't necessarily get fresh produce either. So, you know, humans, because we have these large brains, have figured out ways around the basic problem of our not being able to produce vitamin C. But the fact of the matter is we can't. Other animals can. It's not fair. Sometimes I wonder if I would create myself with an exoskeleton. I mean, I can't decide. Like, would I want exterior protection or would that just be cumbersome? I don't know. Well, exterior protection does have a lot of advantages. It makes it hard to grow. However, this is why lobsters, for instance, when they grow, when they outgrow their shells, they have to basically molt They get rid of their old shell, and then they're kind of soft and vulnerable for a little while, and then they grow a new shell. 
But if you could get around that vulnerability problem for a while, I mean, having an exoskeleton would have a lot of advantages if you wanted to ride a motorcycle, for instance. Think of all those soft tissues that would be in a lot less trouble. Yeah, I mean, um, or if you get in a bar fight, all right, you just want to look badass, right? You just want to look badass. Check out my exoskeleton. I look like a Marvel hero. I don't know if it's even right. practical, but this is how my <laughs> mind works, Doctor Hafer. This is how my mind works, Doctor Hafer. You are, of course, proof of uh, the big brain on the human <laughs> primates, and you're always just so rich with good information, and I enjoy your sense of humor and. And I'm going to point everybody to your book because so often we hear about, I mean, like, I don't have a dog in this fight. I, I don't really, like, I'm not offended if someone says we are intelligently designed. I'm not insecure about it. I just think it doesn't make any sense if we look around at the monumental waste and what is it, 99% of all animals that, or, you know, animal species that were ever to have existed have apparently died off. Is You're the zoologist. Is that an accurate number? That's probably pretty close. Yes. I mean, if you want to start getting into non-human species, yeah, this whole business of having this grand and wonderful, great designer. If our designs are so great, then why have 99% of all species gone extinct? And the answer there is because that's the way evolution works. Evolution doesn't really care how we feel. Like the universe doesn't care. It just kind of does what it does. Dr. Abby Hafer, always a joy. And uh, the link to your book in the description box. Let's talk again soon, okay? Okay, great. Thanks for talking to me. Okay, let me finish here by reading a couple of pages, the last two pages of Dr. Hafer's book. I just wanted to end on a high note, right? Something positive. And again, this is after she has just dismantled these claims about intelligent design. Chapter 35, two pages. They say this. They say evolution. The greatest indisputably true story ever told. She said, I want to talk about beauty. I want to point out that the human body is actually wonderful. It's just that it's wonderful in the weird, crazy way that evolved systems are wonderful. Rather than being wonderful in the careful, mathematical way that designed systems are. There's real beauty and utility here but not pre-planned design. I also think our bodies are beautiful the way they are, regardless of their imperfections. But I also think that there is also real beauty in our ability to think, do research, and really understand the world we live in, rather than just making up stories. This capacity allows us to understand atoms and molecules that we can't even see, and principles we can't see that allow airplanes to fly, electrons we can't see that light up electric light bulbs, and yes, evolution, which often takes eons to occur. So no human being can see it working, but we understand it, and we can make successful predictions based on it. So we know it's there. ID does not make predictions. Evolutionary theory does. The evolution of antibiotic-resistant bacteria can only be understood by evolutionary theory. Antibiotic-resistant bacteria are now killing people we used to be able to cure. I fear having public health officials who don't believe in evolution. Ecology, which is the interplay between different plants and animals and their environments, can only be understood if you understand evolution. I fear having environmental policy made by people who don't believe in evolution. I realize that many people don't like the fact that there are unanswered questions in evolution. However, there are unanswered questions in every scientific field. Modern physicists don't know whether gravity is smooth and continuous or comes in little particles. Yet we use modern physics every day to launch satellites and they stay in orbit. Biblical physics couldn't do that. You don't throw out an entire scientific field because there are a few unanswered questions. In fact, the whole point behind science is to investigate unanswered questions. That's what research is all about. 
If there are no unanswered questions, then there is no research. If there are no unanswered questions, then there is no hope for improvement. If there are no unanswered questions, then the world is a far duller place. Unanswered questions are why scientists go to work every morning. Awe and wonder are as much a part of science as they are a part of any religion. I realize that many people dislike what they think are the implications of evolution. If it's all about eating and breeding and dying, they wonder, where do beauty and meaning and justice fit in? Where does purpose fit in? Where indeed? One answer is that they fit in where we decide to put them. If we human beings think that beauty and meaning and justice and purpose are important, then it is up to us to put them into our lives and into our world, rather than waiting for God to hand them to us on a silver platter. I realize that other people may be afraid to accept evolution because they want to believe in the uniqueness of human beings. Fortunately, science tells us that we as a species are indeed unique. So is every other species. What's more, it's clear that we are not particularly favored by any god or gods, whatever our egos may tell us to the contrary. Does that mean we're worthless? Far from it. We can experience awe and wonder. We have an amazing ability to figure things out. We can make art and appreciate beauty. We can build cities yet appreciate wilderness. We can strive to be the best that we can be and to build the best society that we can build. We can require justice in the firm knowledge that no one has any divine rights and we can love each other and love this planet. I realize that in writing this book, I may be preaching to the choir. However, our public discourse on evolution needs simple, straightforward arguments in order to counter the false claims made by the proponents of ID. In other words, we need talking points, ones that we can bring to our legislators, school boards, and politicians of all stripes. I've tried to provide talking points that anybody can use right here in this book. So there are times when preaching to the choir is exactly the right thing to do. We need clarification, reassurance, and solid political-style arguments if we are going to defend evolution against pseudoscientists and political pressure groups. In fact, my main hope for this book is that I've given you, the choir, some great new songs to sing. And in all cases, keep in mind that evolution is the greatest indisputably true story ever told. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com. 